Okay, we now have Chris Edsall talking. Thanks, Yuan. Um, I come from an organisation uh, named the National Institute of uh, Water and Atmospheric Research. Uh, that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll just refer to it as uh, NIWA from now on. Um, when the call for papers for the sysadmin mini-conference went out, one of the suggestions was site-related how we do things talks, so this is going to be one of those. Um, and therefore the title, Free and Open Source Software in Environmental Prediction, is possibly a little bit grandiose, since I have an inkling about um, what people are doing at other environmental prediction sites, but I can only really talk with authority about what we do. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, NIWA for the benefit of the people in the audience who aren't from New Zealand. I'll talk about the EcoConnect project that's um, been underway since about 2005. EcoConnect's the brand name we've given for uh, um, environmental forecasting and real-time observation delivery system. And um, that'll set the scene to um, give a, a, a sort of a detailed listing of the free and open source software tools we've used to implement it, and I think I feel a little bit uneasy now having just listened to Frank's talk about his um, catalogue of um, way too many things, because uh, it's a big list and uh, we can check the uh, hell box and the oracle box and various other ones, but we'll get to that. Um, so NIWA is a Crown Research Institute, which means it's a for-profit company. Um, it only has one shareholder, which is the Government of New Zealand. Um, what we do could be, um, you could compare it to bits of CSIRO in Australia, the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation, uh, and also bits of the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, specifically the research bits. Um, so NIWA does research and consulting in um, those main areas. Um, from atmosphere and climate, we get the numerical weather prediction and the climate simulations and the things that go into the IPCC um, assessment reports on global climate change. Um, from the freshwater, um, relevant to this talk, we look at hydrology, which is river flows. Um, on the coasts, we look at um, inundation. Um, and in the oceans, uh, we run a wave model. We run ocean models as well, but they're not part of the environmental prediction suite, and I'm not going to talk about fisheries and aquaculture. Um, our main customers are the, um, the government through its various ministries, um, local governments, that is, you know, regional authorities, um, and commercial, peop uh, commercial people. Um, by New Zealand standards, we're a reasonably large company. There's 750 employees, and we're spread throughout the um, length of the country. Uh, in, a, in 12 sites, and uh, we also have an 80% um, share in an environmental um, instrumentation firm uh, called Unidata, based in Perth. So, as I mentioned, EcoConnect is an operational real-time forecasting and data delivery service. Operational means it can't go down, and real-time means uh, it can't really be late. It's more than just um, a weather forecast. Uh, one of our chief scientists quotes there is, uh, it's not what the weather is, but what the weather does. And so to, to figure out what the weather is going to do, we have to couple the numerical weather prediction model into various other models. So for instance, the wind from the, the weather model drives the waves, the, um, the rain from the weather model, the temperature, and uh, one other thing is input into the river flow model. You have to sum the river flow model, the inundation model, and the tide model to figure out whether you're going to get a flood at the river mouth or not. Um, it was developed by a large number of people across uh, four of those 12 sites um, with a you know, varying degree of um, skill and familiarity with um, software tools and software development. Um, we did have a bunch of um, professional software developers and like Frank said, they were .NET developers and they were in high demand and they've all gone now. Uh, <laughs> but we, fortunately, we do still have the source. Um, and I think one of the things that 
I mean, this project has been, well, I think it's successful. I've got a vested interest in saying that, is that um, right from the very beginning, um, we brought sysadmins into the planning stages and at every stage of the process. So it wasn't just you know, the developers say, oh, it works on my desktop, throw it over the wall to the sysadmins. Um, it, was, it was reasonably well planned. Um, so this isn't very sysadmin related, but um, it's got pretty pictures, and um, <laughs> it's for your interest. Um, the models we run, um, the weather model is the, we call it the NZ LAM, it's the New Zealand Limited Area Model. Um, and it runs on a 12-kilometer grid. So that picture on the screen there is 384 by 384 pixels, or 384 grid points, each spaced 12 kilometers apart. The model actually comes from the United Kingdom, um, from the United Kingdom Met Office. It's called the Unified Model, um, because you can use it in a climate mode where it uh, is also an, an atmospheric and an ocean model, but um, on the time scales that we're dealing with, you can pretty much ignore the ocean stuff. Um, we run it over quite a large domain, so everything you see in the map there is, is simulated in the model. To perform it, you start with the um, lateral boundary conditions from the global model. So the global model runs at the United Kingdom Met Office in England. They do a forecast, and then we cut out a rectangle, which is the values around the outside of that square, um, and that gives you then they, they give us the temperature, pressure, all, all the physical values around the edge, and that constrains our local model. It has to match up to the global model at the edges at every hour, or at every time step, rather. Um, we perform data assimilation, which means we take um, the... Uh, to do a model for, for one cycle, you take the output of the model from the previous cycle, um, which will be slightly wrong, and then you add in the new observations. Um, you've got to be very careful when you do that. If you just throw them all in at time zero, the analysis time, the model is numerically unstable, and it, um, it blows up. You get non-physical artifacts in it. Um, so we use a thing called incremental update. It just trickles in the changes over the three hours before time zero and the three hours after. Um, technically, it's called uh, 3D variational data assimilation. Uh, we run a 48-hour forecast twice per day. Um, everything in meteorology is done in, in UTC, so we run it at 6Z and 18Z. And in between times at 0Z and 12Z, we run just a short model just to, to tide us over to the, to the next long model. So that's the weather. Um, we run a model called WaveWatch. No, I, was, I should, should mention, since I'm talking about open source, uh, the licensing, the UM is not open source. Um, WaveWatch 3 is available for download. I'm not entirely sure what the license is. Um, you have to fill in a request form, so I think they probably want to make sure you're, you're doing it right. Uh, so it comes from NOAA and NSEP. We run a model of all the world's oceans once per day, and that goes out for, um, it produces a six day long forecast. Um, and that's a quite coarse resolution. I think you can see on the screen the big square blocks around Australia um, for each of the, the grid squares, so it doesn't resolve the coastline very well. In fact, it seems that the top of Australia is joining up with Indonesia there, um, which isn't physical. But um, we run a higher resolution um, wave model, we call it NZ Wave, over exactly the same domain as the, the weather model, and we run that. Um, uh, twice per day, and the forecast goes out for two days. And we can also run even finer resolution models, and um, we do that for Cook Strait, which for um, people who aren't from New Zealand is the, the stretch of water that's between the North Island and the South Island. And if any, anybody's ever taken a ferry across Cook Strait, you'll know that the, uh, the waves have a, a large effect on whether you enjoy the, the journey or not. The hydrology model is called TopNet that's um, developed at NIWA. Um, it's a river network model. So each of the little blue lines you see on the screen is a, a stream or a tributary. I think technically the term is a river reach. And they all join up to form a network. Um, and we model each catchment separately. So the one on the screen is the Buller um, Basin in the West Coast of the South Island, um, 
Each of the black dots is a river gauge, and we can, although we are not currently, do doing data assimilation on the model, so we can um, we can discipline the, the the forecast of the river model by adding in the actual river measurements, uh, and that should uh, we're not doing that at the moment, but that should greatly uh, improve the f the quality of the forecast of that. Uh, this is another NEWA model. This is uh, the rivers, coasts, and oceans model, or RECOM. It's an inundation model. And a uh, question at the back? Um, it, it varies quite a bit, um, and you can tune it. So um, the, the guy who does the river model wanted to do something, and each run would have produced 100 gigs, and he wanted to do 10,000 of them per basin and 200 basins for the country or whatever. And I, said, I, I, I multiplied it all out for him and said, no, that's just ridiculous. And he goes, ah, oh, OK, well. And he, 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 he tweaked some parameters in the model and came back, and it was about a tenth the size. Um, we, for the weather model, we definitely don't dump all the variables at every time step for that. Um, the, the time step, I think, is five minutes, but we only dump one hourly values out. So a 48-hour forecast on the weather model will be four gigs of raw data, and then the post-processing, which I'm going to come to, blows that out um, quite a bit. Uh, just to explain the picture on the screen, um, it, it's the sea height, sea surface height with the tide removed, and so blue is lower than average and red is higher, and it's, it's only plus or minus a quarter of a metre, the inundation. On, on this particular day, I just downloaded this on Saturday morning, so this would have been Saturday. Um, speaking of the tide, we model the tide, and it's not a particularly hard problem. I think Babbage was doing it with a, a mechanical computer. And that's the same colours again. Red is higher and blue is lower. Um, and that's plus or minus one and a quarter metres. One thing to note is the, uh, the sign is always... Just an interesting New Zealand geographical thing. The sign is always different across Cook Strait. So when it's high on one side, it's low on the other. And there's a strong current. And the, the, the tides rotate round and it flips around the other way. So Cook Strait's a good place for generating wave energy. Uh, those are the models we're running at the moment. Um, in theory, we could plug in any other model. And so this is the generic uh, workflow. You pre-process the data you've got into the model's native data format. Of course, they all have their own different one. You run the model. It produces output in its format. You post-process that, and uh, we produce net CDF output. Um, Optionally, at this stage, you can then insert a thing called um, model output statistics, which corrects site-specific biases in the model by looking at um, the, the previous observations and the previous model output, um, because the model, some of the models do have site-specific things due to not being able to resolve things smaller than the grid size and various scientific reasons. It's all kosher, um, I'm assured. The, then um, you take that NetCDF data visualize it, um, so we produce PostScript, the, um, the maps that you've just seen, and time series data in XML, and that's, that's our end product. That's one of the things we fire off to the, the database to serve to the users, the XML. Um, we don't make the users rasterize the PostScript because some of the files take quite a, quite a while to do, so we rasterize them for them into PNG. Um, so that's our problem. To do it, the systems we've got to do it on, we've got a supercomputer that runs the, the weather model and the two wave models. That's a uh, Cray T3E 1200 with 544 processing elements, um, or PEs. We don't use the whole computer for operations. We've got to do research as well. So the, the weather model runs on 216 PEs and the wave models run on 180. Uh, once the models are done on the supercomputer. We transfer the data to a um, eight-core machine for post-processing. That machine also handles the sequencing of the models um, and runs the smaller models like TopNet and Recom. Um, after all of that data is done, we throw it into the database, and a J2E application uh, serves it up to the clients. Um, it doesn't, in fact, serve it via the web. What we're doing is using web services and SOAP. And so it can be used in a business-to-business -business fashion. So if your business model 
um, relies on having good forward warning of, of the weather, then you can maybe automate some processes within your business to download forecasts and, and do things. Um, and we provide a .NET based um, rich internet application to um, display the data, which hopefully, uh, if I've made the right sacrifices to the demo gods, we'll see later. Um, we have a small server to do the um, source code management, bug tracking, um, stored documentation, and we rely on some stuff outside of the, um, the EcoConnect systems, just within the normal NIWA environment for monitoring SMTP servers, DNS servers, that sort of thing. Right, finally, some sysadmin and, and FOSS content. Um, the operating systems, we run RHEL uh, 5.x, it was 5.2, I'm planning on going to 5.3. Um, I was very pleased to learn of the extra packages for Enterprise Linux project because when I started doing this, we had RHEL and that's, that's fine for you know, running an Apache server, but if you want to do more things on it, you've got to add your own software. So a lot of it was in Fedora, so I'd take the Fedora source RPMs and rebuild them. Um, the EPEL repo just formalizes that process and means that I have less work to do, which is great. Um, the Cray runs Unicos MK as its operating system, which is not uh, a free or open source operating uh, um, software, but um, they do provide um, open source software that they've compiled um, uh, as binaries. Um, that's great too because I used to have to compile SSH and because I wasn't a Unicos MK kernel hacker I didn't realize that you had to give up um, a credential when you ran the ran the daemon and for a while for a couple of weeks people were logging in and getting root access. So um, <laughs> again I'm happy that you know, the open source model means you know, somebody else can, can go away and do the work and uh, you, you know, some things that you had to do manually can now be done automated and you can go and do something else with your time. Um, we used to run Fedora on the desktops and we're currently running SLED. Um, that's for the scientists and some of the software developers. Suzy Linux Enterprise Desktop. Uh, yes, come and see me after. <laughs> it's only a 25 minute talk, so yeah. <laughs> Um, we do use um, quite a bit more FOSS. Um, everybody has their own favorite editor. If you look at your badge, I think it's the middle one in your list of three preferences. Um, as a sysadmin, I use Vim, but people use Emacs, people use Eclipse. The revision control is done in Darks. That's for the, um, for the science models and for the sequencing code. And the, the professional developers doing the .NET stuff um, did their version control in Subversion. We're using Darks 1.x, well, I think x is 9, um, and the question is do we go to Darks 2 or do we look at some of the other distributed revision control systems that are around now that, that weren't before, like Git, um, do we look at Bizarre Mercurial, and so you know, we're following carefully the GNOME process. Gosh, five minutes to go. Okay, compilers. Can you make? I, I, do, I do want to point this out because um, a lot of people think makes just for building software. Basically, um, if you've got a, a program that will take input from one file type and produce output of another file type, you can get make to automate that process. So for instance, uh, if you've got netcdf input and um, postscript output, you can generate your 15,000 um, images with make. Um, and you can use all eight cores on your post-processing server by going make minus J8. Um, we're going to look to um, changing to SCONS. We considered ANT and um, CMake, but the guy who made the choice decided on SCONS. Um, GDB, STrace, and LSOF aren't really good for making software, but they're fantastic for finding out what went wrong. Um, we use Hibernate as our object relational mapper, and we use Axis to provide the web services. Um, we chose NetCDF as the um, standard file format, um, and in particular, we chose the uh, CF compliant, and I'm sorry about the spelling mistake, uh, metadata for climate and forecasting, which means that you know, everybody around the world agrees that the rainfall is going to be in kilograms per square meter instead of kilograms per square kilometer or something like that. 
Um, once you've made a choice to use NetCDF, then, you've, uh, then you can take advantage of a whole lot of um, programs, NetCDF operators, including the wonderfully named NCKS, NetCDF Kitchen Sync, um, NC View for quick and dirty viewing of the output, and NC Regrid. Um, NCL is the NCAR graphics command language. NCAR graphics is the thing we use to draw the graphs. R is the thing we use to do the statistics, to do the model output statistics. Image magic, uh, again, for quick and dirty animation, and um, also in the background, it calls GhostScript to do the rasterization. I've used GThumb. I'm looking for a good gallery software project that will operate on the files in place rather than moving them somewhere else and importing them into a database. So if you know of something like that, please come and see me after. Sorry? Yeah. Um, the, the sequencing of the models is done in some horrible bash I wrote. It's being rewritten in Python. Uh, um, once the uh, job is ready to run, we hand it off to generic NQS. That's what we started with. Now we went through the whole family tree of those batch queuing systems. The good thing about the batch queuing system, even though we don't use it really as, it, as it's intended, is it does save the standard output and standard error for forensic work later on when something's gone wrong. Um, Nagios is great. We write lots of local scripts. It's easy to interface to. Cacti is really good for d getting a whole lot of graphs. You, you don't have to deal with the RRD st stuff yourself. Um, we alert from Nagios by sending stuff to SendMail uh, and to Pages because SMS isn't a reliable delivery service. Um, Stephen Ellis is going to talk about Track tomorrow, so if you want to know about that, come tomorrow. Um, downloading the data from the UKMO uh, was an interesting problem. Uh, I started with wget, it didn't produce the st statistics I liked, so I used curl and that did, but unfortunately it didn't get the bandwidth I wanted. Uh, we have what's called a long fat network between us and the UKMO, 350 milliseconds. Uh, they bandwidth limit us at the other end, and so we could only get about um, 50 kilobits per second throughput on a single stream. Um, so to get the 200 kilobits we um, put four streams together with LFTP. Um, I won't talk about non-FOSS, and I'm going to brave this. Having laptop issues with the, oh, there we, there's the mouse, right, I'll maximize that out. Uh, so this is the rich internet application, um, basically there's a catalogue of all the products down the left hand side, when you click on one it um, downloads it, uh, here's a simple one, this is a, a meteogram, uh, the red line is the temperature, the blue line is the relative humidity, uh, the green bars are precipitation, um, the barbs are the wind, so the, the arrows are the wind direction and the barbs the wind speed in knots, a um, full length barb is 10 knots and a half length bar is 5. Um, and it shows you it's been, there's been a lot of high cloud in Auckland and it's forecast to continue. And it might have rained this morning. Um, pictures. Is it hot in Australia? So purple is hot, and yeah, it's getting quite hot in, <laughs> in Australia. And it's quite cold in New Zealand, too. <laughs> yeah, we probably didn't need to buy a supercomputer to tell us that, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, here's the, um, the tide. So that's the tide rotating around and the, the opposite sign of high or low tide across Cook Strait. Uh, where's the, the, this is the traditional weather map, the mean sea level pressure. Um, we've also coloured the, um, 
the thing according to the wind speed. So um, blue is very low wind speed um, and red is high. You can see, if you look at Tasmania, you can see the blue sort of spiralling off there. The um, Tasmania acts as a, the hill that gives a, a lee effect and then you get vortex shedding off the edge of it. Um, right, I think that's about it. <laughs> Time for questions? Or? Yeah, if Nathan's got to come down and, and get ready for the next presentation, maybe we can take a couple of questions while he does that. So, any questions? Um, what do we use to rasterize the outputs? Um, we call image magic, which calls uh, ghost script in the background, and I think it does an unnecessary um, PN, postscript to PNG, uh, PNM, then PNM to PNG step. And so I think we could possibly, it, it takes a long time to do this. It takes you know, an hour and a half to do the forecast and um, half an hour to do the post-processing. And then because of um, an issue with our firewall, a long time to ingest the, the products from the app server into the database. Um, so the, the 6Z forecast isn't really ready until 1400 or 1430. The reason I chose the speaking slot today is those, those forecasts we were looking at were the 6Z ones from this morning. Um, they've only just been available for the last hour or so. So if I did the talk this morning, we'd have had a 12 hour older forecast. Yes. Um, we, 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 we run the model, at the moment we run the model on the long cycles. So we run it twice per day out for 48 hours. Um, the next step is to do it hourly, so rerun it hourly with the new data coming in every hour. Um, and one, one thing I didn't show you is in the J2E application you can set alerts. So if you're an emergency manager you can say, warn me if the forecast level of the river is going to go over you know, 300 QMEX and they'll get a page or an SMS or something like that. So um, yes, it could be used. Uh, yes, we do it continuously, and yes, it can be used usefully for um, flood protection in the morning. But back in the blue shirt. Yes, um, but not much. Not as much as I would like, uh, which is something I'm going to take up with our, our management. Um, so I signed up for the OpenSUSE build service um, in November and built a couple of packages on that. Uh, and that's great because um, the OpenSUSE build service doesn't just build SUSE packages and doesn't just build RPM packages, RPM-based ones. You can even build deb-based packages off it. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's quite good. Um, yeah, um, bug reports and a little bit of packaging is so far what we've contributed back.